Therefore, Therefore. Astu, Astu, may it be, may, it be. may. my, Nata, Nata. O oh Master, oh Saha, Saha. that, Muribhagaha, greatest good fortune, Bhave, in the birth, Atra, this, Ba, or, Anyatra, in some other birth, to, Indeed. Fa or Tirascham among the animals. Yena by which Aham I Ekaha one Api even Bhavat or your Janadam Devotees, Bhutwa, becoming, Nisheve, I may fully engage in serving, Tava, your, Padapalavam, the lotus feet. <coughs> hmm. Translation. My dear Lord, I therefore pray to be so fortunate that in this life, as Lord Brahma, or in another life, wherever I take my birth, I may be counted as one of your devotees. I pray that wherever I may be, even among the animal species, I can engage in devotional service to your lotus feet. So you can repeat. My dear Lord, I therefore pray to be so fortunate that in this life as Lord Brahma or in another life wherever I take my birth I may be counted as one of your devotees. That uh, I pray that where, at, wherever I may be even among the animal species I can engage in devotional service to your lotus feet. So there's no purport to this text. However, the uh, Acharyas have commented quite a bit on this text. And what one comment I wanted to make, actually, so before I go ahead to the next text, I just want to make a few comments. This is a very common theme, uh, as we hear from Bhakti Vinodhya, Kita Janma Hoi Yatatu Yadas. Brahma Mukha. That uh, I will not even take birth, Brahma Janma Nahiyas, as Lord Brahma, if Bhati uh, Mukha, if I'm a non devotee, Lord Brahma but I'll take birth as a worm in the house of your devotees. It's actually a very important point. And then uh, the Acharya's comment that actually he's uh, indicating that he would like to take birth as a deer in Vrindavan. Uh, and that's because he gets a chance to lick Krishna's lotus feet. This is really interesting. <laughs> That'd be really nice to be a deer and lick Krishna's lotus feet. So, uh, what, what this means, as far as we are concerned, is that we should be averse, that means against, uh, the association of people who are not Krishna conscious. Of course, at the same time, it doesn't mean we hate them, we demonize people who are not Krishna conscious, but we are actually, the people we want to hang out with, reveal our minds to, live with should all be Krishna conscious and actually Krishna conscious not Kanishta Adhikari is uh, Kanishta Adhikari means neophyte a neophyte devotee is basically engaged in fighting that's why they're called neophytes 
new fights. I know that was not what the word means. But still, engage in fault finding and fighting in the name of, uh, even in the name of religion. Just like Prabhupada commented, uh, told the story about the two men who were uh, having an argument about whether something was cut with a scissors or a knife. And they were fighting, actually they started fighting each other and beating each other up and finally the one who was in favor of the knife beat, uh, as the instrument that had cut whatever the fruit from the tree, uh, threw the scissors guy into the river. And the scissors guy was going down for the third time as he was going down, it was like that. So, so many times we find people like having arguments even on the basis of the philosophical platform or the cultural platform or the traditional platform. And there's this, this anger where they just want to criticize each other. It's called an ad hominem attack, where they criticize each other uh, personally, denigrate each other personally. Actually, recently in the, uh, this interesting thing that's going on in the uh, Senate of the United States, uh, I won't describe what it is that's going on, but there's something interesting going on. And, well, it's a court case. You know, impeachment, I guess I should say it. Yeah. It's impeachment, you know, whatever. I didn't want to bring it into class. But anyway, so what, what happened is that it's being presided over by the uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, who was a very sober gentleman. And so basically he had to chastise both parties for engaging in inappropriate behavior. Not, as a, not a question of talking about the facts of the case, but they were actually basically calling each other, each other's party's names, you know, ad hominem attacks. So we find, unfortunately, that uh, spiritualists sometimes tend to do that too. I mean, just like we see in the uh, Catholic Church, you have this Pope Francis who is, I would say, rather liberal. And the past Pope was uh, Benedict who is more conservative. And he's basically their uh, yeah, past pope, even though he vowed to keep quiet when he resigned and went into retirement, he's speaking very strongly against the present pope, at least they published a book and his name is in the book, uh, against the present pope because the present pope wants to, pope, wants to allow some of the uh, people who are in South America because they have a scarcity of priests. He wants to let some of them get married. I mean, older men. Or whatever. Or they're already married, I'm sorry. They're already married. He wants to let them become priests because there's no other priests. And so there's this big conflict in the church over this, which has nothing to do with anything that Lord Jesus Christ ever said. Nothing to do with anything in the Bible. And not even going against uh, the actual original tradition of the Catholic Church, which is the, originally the priests were married. If you look at the beginning of the Catholic Church. So they're fighting over these things. And, that, and we as conditioned souls, we have this tendency to fight over, over things like that. And of course, in ISKCON, we have our own little controversies, such as... Can ladies become Krishna conscious? I don't think ladies become <laughs> gurus or not. And someone said, no, they can just become sixty gurus. They can just become, no, sixty and diksha are the same. And it's back and forth. Oh my God, I'm not taking a side in this. You all know where I stand. So it's just like Hare Krishna, you know. When we talk about more important things like the world is. Uh, going to hell, you know, basically. And there's so many conditioned souls out there suffering, e eating meat, and their next life they're going to become whatever they're going to become, you know, animals, cows, cockroaches, uh, hogs, dogs, whatever. And here we are, you know, just like, how many angels can you fit on the head of a pin? Isn't it? 
I mean, I, that, that's a funny statement. You know, they talk about that in the church, you know, the, how many angels can you fit in the head of a pen? Or, you know, of course you can fit quite a few because the soul is one ten thousand the tip of the hair. So we actually have an answer to that particular question. So, anyway, so we aspire to, to be around people who are Krishna conscious. Otherwise, it's like being in a cage of fire, fire or lions and tigers. And if we can be amongst the devotees and amongst the pure devotees, then it doesn't really matter what the situation is. And actually, that statement is there. Narayana Paraksarve, Nakutashtana Vimiti, Swarga Babarga, Nalakeshu, Abhituri Artha Darshana, that's from the Bhagavatam. That, uh, it's spoken by Lord Shiva, that uh, the topmost devotee of Narayan, Paraksarve, Nakutashtana, he sees everything the same. Abhituri uh, Artha Darshana, because whether he's in heaven or hell, not a Keshu, or goes back to God. He is serving Krishna and is associating with the devotees. So we should pray like that. And actually, if we commit offenses against the devotees, the uh, primary uh, punishment we will get is that we will be separated from the devotees. And also we'll lose the taste for hearing and chanting about Krishna. That's it, the punishments you get. Not necessarily that you can be swallowed by some crocodile in Florida. Uh, sorry, Florida doesn't have crocodiles. Alligators in Florida or anything like that. Or bit by a snake. It's just you be separate from the devotees. You want to be Krishna conscious and you can be punished like that. Very sad. Anyway, so this is the prayer of Lord Brahma. And as Daivir Prabhu mentioned yesterday, which I thank you very much for, the next verse... And some of the verses here don't have any purports. Uh, the next verse uh, and the following verses, several verses, are quoted in the uh, Brihad Bhagavatamrita with elaborate purports uh, by Sanatana Goswami. And uh, Gopi Pranada and the Prabhu has actually given his own purports based upon the purports of Sanatana Goswami, because Sanatana Goswami wrote the purports for his own literature. Uh, so, I'm going to go ahead, since today's verse didn't have a purport, we're going to read the next text. And the next text doesn't have a purport here, but we're going to read the purport in the Brihad Bhagavatam, which is quite lengthy and quite instructive. So these prayers are extremely important. Even though the purports here are not so elaborate, uh, when you read the commentaries of the Acharya, which Fortunately, I have. Uh, the commentaries are very elaborate. That's Sanatana Goswami's commentary, Jiva Goswami's commentary, Vishwanath Chakrabarti Thakur's commentary, and Rupa Goswami's commentaries. They're actually quite lengthy. And Gopi Pranada and Prabhu uh, based his uh, commentary on their commentaries too. Although each commentary is probably about five of these pages if you take all the acharyas together. So we're going to continue reading from text 31 of these beautiful prayers offered by Lord Brahma to Krishna. Aho Tridanya Raja Gopa Ramanya Stanyam Ritam Pita Mativate Muda Yasham Vivo Vatsat O Almighty Lord, how greatly fortunate are the cows and ladies of Vrindavan, the nectar of whose breast milk you have happily drunk to your full satisfaction, taking the form of their calves and children. All the Vedic sacrifices performed from time immemorial up to the present day have not given you as much satisfaction. Whew, amazing verse. And uh, here it's, it's touched upon that actually, uh, I mean, the Acharyas also mentioned, because I read the commentaries of the Acharyas, that, uh, that Krishna is actually extremely anxious and hungry 
to drink the breast milk of all the gopis. Therefore, he arranged for Lord Brahma to steal all the coward boys. Okay. So Krishna could expand himself. And Krishna was also anxious to drink the milk from all the cows. <laughs> so it's really, Lord Brahma, in one sense, is actually fulfilling all of, esoterically, fulfilling all of Krishna's intense desires to reciprocate with all <coughs> the elderly gopis who have this vatsalya ras. In the same way as he reciprocates with Yashoda Mai. So it's like Krishna's intense desire. I want it, I want it. And Krishna, like little boys sometimes, they actually say, you know, I want it, I want it, I want it. Well, Krishna, when he wants it, he gets it. That's the difference. <laughs> okay, so here's the report. Let's see if this is, I think it's the same, yeah, it's the same word by word. Translation. They haven't read exactly. Yeah, exactly. So we won't read the word by word translation. So, so the translation is the same. I think. Almighty Lord, how greatly fortunate are the cows and ladies of Vrindavan, taking the form of their calves and children. You have happily drunk to your full satisfaction the nectar of their breast milk. All the Vedic sacrifices performed from time immemorial up to the present day have not given you as much satisfaction. <clears throat> so here's the commentary. Text 97 through 106, this is referring to the text numbers in the Brihad Bhagavatam, form the final part of Lord Brahma's prayers to Krishna and Vrindavan. That's with Bhagavatam 10, 14, 31 to 40. While in Vrindavan, <coughs> Brahma witnessed the unlimited mercy of Krishna and bathed in the rasa of Krishna's omnipotency. Or omnipotence. In other words, omnipotence means all powerful. So, Lord Brahma's ras or taste was just like on reverence at this particular point. You understand? Whereas the gopis and the uh, coward boys and uh, some of Krishna's servants and the mothers and parents of Krishna they bathe in a different type of rust, a more intimate rust. So after Krishna removed the misgivings from Brahma's heart, Brahma was also able to taste that rasa fully. So now Brahma understands the greatest way one can praise the personality of God is simply to describe the unlimited glories of his devotees and devotional service. From the very beginning of his life, Brahma had prayed to the Supreme Lord for bhakti, the most fortunate of goals, but only now that he has received the special mercy of Krishna and Vrindavan has the true greatness of the Brajabhasis been revealed to him. Now that he has some idea of just how much they cherish Krishna, he hopes to obtain the same kind of bhakti they have, and he claims then the Supreme Lord's most fortunate devotees. So a little commentary on that is that uh, the Acharyas, they actually, like Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, he just wants to take the remnants of the untouchables. Now, what are untouchables? Untouchables means basically those who are considered very, very low caste, that nobody will go near, that uh, even if they step on your shadow, if you happen to be a Brahmin, you want to kill them. In India, those are what's untouchables. You know, those people who clean uh, the gutters, those people who, you know, sweepers, like that. And so, unfortunately, we Westerners, or we people who've just come to Krishna consciousness, and I'm just speaking to someone this morning about this, while well, the rest of you were in your beds, tucked up, dreaming of sugar plums. Um, <laughs> I was actually just talking and communicating with someone about this, <coughs> that, or about the residence of Braj, 
how great devotees they are and the, the simple devotees. So we as Westerners sometimes go there receiving bungies. You know what bungie is? Bungie means the people who clean out the ditches. And we think we're better, or we think we're better than, hey, we think we're better than the pandas, we think. In other words, we criticize the residents of Vrindavan. Even though, you know, some of them are trying to take your money. <laughs> but you know who, how can you criticize them when you're engaged in some business here? You know, you may be uh, selling things in the temple store and saying, for you, there's no profit. And there is a profit. Or financing cars or whatever <laughs> you're doing. Uh, to make a living, so that's how they make a living. But of course, we don't want to get cheated. But even their cheating is sort of like, we should do it in a loving way, we respond to them. In other words, we don't get angry. I remember there was one devotee I went with, uh, and we were in uh, Radhakund. And they, you know, now they try to get money, you know, let me do the sacrifice for you, like some of my friends. Actually, I have, I'm friendly, very friendly with the pandas there. Or they like to be friendly with me. Because <laughs> they, they, they love me because I bring people, bring clients, and they don't give me any cut. So anyway, so, so he, he was very, he, he, he got upset with one of the pandas who simply wanted money. I mean, so, so does everybody in the West want money. I mean, you think uh, the head of Microsoft is just like, oh, he's so great, he's so sophisticated. But it's the same thing. So you think he's great, you think the pandas are bad. So he, he actually tried to push one of the pandas away with the uh, point of a tripod. And the panda just got down and started to curse him. And I said, all right, you bow down, touch his feet. Cry, beg for forgiveness. He said, why? You want my money? I said, do it! And he finally did it, and hopefully he was forgiven. So you don't understand who you're dealing with. These residents of Pradhamma, uh, like Jagadananda Pandit, uh, Lord Chaitanya's dear most devotee, who is Satyabhama, Krishna was advised by Lord Chaitanya not to spend more than a little while, like two weeks, Fortnight. That's actually what Dr. Vinod Thakur said. He spent a fortnight on the Holy Down. Fortnight means two weeks. He was advised not to spend time, that much time because you begin to see the residents of Vrindavan as being just ordinary. And uh, you know, you, you think, oh, uh, I'm going to give my mercy to the residents of Vrindavan. Oh my God! If one thinks like that, they're <coughs> I mean, they may not be so educated, but they're very dear to Krishna. It says that when the residents of the higher planets see people in Jagannath Puri, they see them as what? Forearmed. And what to speak of how they see the residents in Vrindavan? You know, this is just, Prabhupada said there's a veneer. People hate it when I say thin veneer. Because veneer also means thin, but I'm just, I'm doing it's an em emphasis. There's a thin veneer of yoga maya there. And, and if you could actually see beneath the surface, you would see something completely different. So these are the devotees, dear most devotees. We should aspire for the dust of their lotus feet. Rather than thinking, you know, we are more fortunate, you know, we're the Westerners, we're the intelligent, we have PhDs. Anyway, this is what I was discussing this morning. So, don't try to guess who I was discussing with. First, so let's continue. First he mentions the greatness of the gopis and cows to serve as Krishna's mothers by giving him their milk. The interjection, a whole, expresses great surprise. And the prefix ati in the word ati danyaha indicates the good fortune of these mothers is extraordinary. <clears throat> By suckling Krishna, the ladies and cows of Braj please him 
And so their glories give pleasure to the entire universe. In other words, Lord Brahma is praising the devotees. It's wonderful. And here's Lord Brahma. Look, look. Just compare. Here's Lord Brahma. He's the head of the whole universe. And there are just some village ladies. I mean, who is more intelligent than Lord Brahma? He has four heads. And he's uh, basically the original preceptor of the uh, Brahma Sampradaya, which we're members of. And so, you know, who can imagine how intelligent he is? And so here are these simple village ladies. Just simple village ladies. And he's glorifying them. I mean, just juxtapose, you know, the two positions of the two personalities of the personality. The mother of the gopis are referred to after cows because the mothers are even more fortunate. Why? Because even though Krishna is not fully satisfied by all the Ashvameda yagyas and all the other sacrifices performed since the creation of the universe by the great demigods and sages like Brahma himself, he is satisfied at every moment while drinking the milk of these mothers. Exalted devas and rishis are expert in gratifying anyone they choose to favor, but they cannot so fully satisfy Krishna. Wow. So in other words, if we want to satisfy Krishna, we have to glorify and serve the residents of Braj. Never think that we are superior. That's the cause of fall down. Krishna assumed the forms of the calves and the sons of all those mothers in Braj just so that he could drink their milk. By using the past tense, he done, Brahma implies that the time for that special arrangement has come to an end for the calves and boys he had stolen have now returned to their mothers. The word ativa, fully, can be understood to be connected either with the preceding word pitam, has been drunk, or the following word muda, the satisfaction. Because of the unlimited affection Krishna has for his devotees, he drank the milk of all those mothers very much and he drank with great pleasure. By addressing Krishna with the word vivo, O infinite Lord, Brahma establishes that even during the time Krishna assumed the forms of the calves and calf herding boys, he remained unlimited. The word vibo also describes Krishna as endowed with supreme mystic power, by which he remains the unlimited absolute truth, even when he appears in limited sizes to entertain his devotees. <laughs> Krishna can easily do what is ordinarily impossible. Although it would have been most appropriate to describe first the glories of the best of Krishna's beloved devotees, Srimati Radharani and her companions, Brahma does not do so because he has not yet realized how extraordinary is the rasa of the gopis' love for Krishna. Since knowledge of the gopis' supreme devotion has not yet awakened in Brahma's heart, he does not pray for elevation to their standard of bhakti in Vrindavan. Uh, I'm sorry. In Vrindavan, Brahma could see Krishna only in the form of Balagopal. So when he begins his prayers, he addresses Krishna as the son of a coward with small tender feet, not as Gopinath, the lord of the gopis. Besides, despite being Krishna's oldest servant, Brahma thinks of himself as Krishna's son, so he naturally wants to avoid intruding into Krishna's amorous affairs. This is interesting. So, in other words, that's his conception of his relationship with God, which is generally the conception of most religions, God the Father. Uh, and actually, Prabhupada comments in that regard that when you think of God as being the Father, then God is generally the order supplier. You know, like our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, give us this day our daily bread. And Prophet, I mean, Prophet jokingly would sometimes say that they've turned God into a baker. 
And then Prabhupada gave the example that if you think of your God like that, then you can be tricked, like the communists tricked people in Russia. They said to the people who didn't have bread, uh, they said, all right, you pray to God to see if you get bread. So they prayed to God, dear God, give us this daily bread, dear God, give us this daily bread, ta 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 They didn't get bread. And they said, now you pray to us. And so they prayed, my dear communists, give us this day our daily bread. However they prayed. And they got bread. So one may think, well, why wasn't Krishna providing? Well, the thing is, Krishna is a good father. And when something is not good for you, or you need to be put into a situation where there's a little intense anxiety, distress, whatever, that's what you need. Anyway, so uh, like a good father sometimes will punish the child, not severely. Will punish the child or don't give them something that will make them sick. As Brikshamar sang these ten verses, he felt in his own heart the moods of Sri Brahma, the spiritual master of all classes of Vaishnava. So, uh, when we talk about Brikshamar singing the te ten verses, let me explain what that means. Uh, Brikshamar in the Brihad Bhagavatamrita is uh, reciting the Brihad Bhagavatamrita to give the essence of the Bhagavatam to his mother Uttara. This was after Parikshit Maharaj had heard the whole Bhagavatam from Shukadeva Goswami. And Uttara came to him and said, you know, tell me what you heard. And Parikshit Maharaj didn't have a lot of time. And so Bhagavatam, the Amrit of the Bhagavatam, were basically the two stories uh, that Parikshit Maharaj recited. The first story, of course, is the story of uh, Lord uh, not Lord, but of Narada Muni looking for the best devotee of the Supreme Personality of God. And he goes through the various devotees. Very interesting story. I advise all the devotees to read the Brihad Bhagavatam. And the second part is this travel of Gopu Kumar, who is trying to come to the point of realizing his eternal relationship with Krishna. Finally, he does as a coward boy. And then he comes back to preach. <laughs> And when he realizes that he's a coward boy and he goes back to the spiritual world, Radharani calls him aside and says, you know, I have this devotee, Matura, a Matura Brahman, and uh, head back down there and preach. And Gopal Kumar describes that sometimes he's in uh, Goloka Vrindavan and sometimes in Gokul Vrindavan, but he actually sees them as the same. Because if one has the vision proper spiritual vision, when one visits uh, Vrindavan, Gokul, this earth planet, one will see it exactly the same as Goloka Vrindavan. One will see the spiritual world. Chintamani. You will see all the trees as Chintamani, desire trees, the cows as desired cows. Confirmed. Anyway. So, these are very nectarian, uh, to use a word that's overused, very nectarian purpose.